Good morning, Facebook. Jesse here. Thank you for tuning in, tuning on to the morning meditation. Dad is uh, doing the lesson today. He's just grabbing a couple markers from downstairs. Um, as you see, Dad likes to highlight, so he's just getting a marker. But we're going to be in Psalm 119, verse 153 through verse 160. And uh, Dad is back, so I'm excited um, for him to share with you guys this morning. Hey, well, thank you, Jesse, for that introduction. By the way, your introduction to Pastor Bill yesterday was very good. I thought that was funny and appropriate because we love Pastor Bill, and um, he's one of the missionaries that we support. We went out to lunch with him afterwards, and, man, he just had so much more to say. Uh, I look forward to having him back soon as a Sunday morning speaker so that he can really give us even more of what it, what's going on in his life because he just really is like a yeah. right out of the book of Acts, you know, oh, yeah. just uh, going to the other most parts of the earth with the gospel and reaching people that need to hear the transforming message of Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. And we are going to open that transforming word again right now to Psalm 119. We're in this particular piece that's called Resh in the Hebrew. Um, and each line of this piece of this poem that is 176 verses long, this section called Resh begins with the Hebrew letter Resh as it moves through. It's just a Hebraic way of writing poetry. It doesn't matter to us theologically, but if you're wondering why Psalm 119 is so long, it's because it actually contains about like, I don't know, just like 22 sub-psalms all compiled into one psalm. That's probably how I would best describe it if I was teaching a Bible class. So with that being said, Jess, we're probably going to pick up in the middle because we left off somewhere around 155. So why don't, uh, if you, would you pray for us and we'll, and we'll get started. Lord, we just ask that you would uh, meet us today with your love, meet us with your mercy. Let me just say, Lord, Hello, peace. Hello, love. Hello, joy. Mm. Hello, faith. Hello, hope. It's a new horizon, Lord. Wow. Yes, Today Lord. is a new day, and Lord, we ask for new yeah, mercy. Yeah. And we know that you already granted, but Lord, we ask for more of yourself. In Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jess. So this is where we were. Let's catch up. Here's the, the word rush. It's kind of crushed in the middle of this pen mark. But it says, consider my affliction and please deliver me. For I do not forget thy law. And we made the point last time we were together is that word for, um, you know, the reason he's pleading with God on behalf of um, his own deliverance is he's saying, Lord, the reason is, is I'm not forgetting your word, right? Um, Plead my cause and deliver me, he says, quicken me according to, by the means of, let the vehicle be your word. Now here he is in verse 55, and he says this, Salvation is far from the wicked, for they seek not thy statutes. Right? So what does the scripture say? Seek and what, Jess? You will find. Right. And seek and you will find. And you will, Jesus said, knock and the door shall be opened unto you. Ask and it shall be given unto you. And right here it's talking about what happens to those who are not seeking. And what he's saying is, is that those who are not seeking the word are not finding salvation. In fact, salvation is far from them because they're not seeking salvation. And I think this is the place we left off was we were asking ourselves, like, what do you seek? Like every one of us woke up this morning and we're seeking after something, right? Maybe we're seeking after multiple things. And I'm just saying how many of them have a, a measures of redemptive value, right? Um, so I got up this morning at 4.30. Why? Because I find, and Jesse and I talk about this like these days, from, I find that actually getting up that early has its own redemptive value because it's a way of saying no to my flesh, no to the carnality that's within me, right? So that I actually say I am body, soul, and spirit, and I want to let my body know that my spirit and soul are going to prevail over my body. And the way that I communicate that to my body is by having my mind say, you have the victory today, not my 
body and sleep. Now, of course, that can get extreme and legalistic. And what happens is, and this is where it all goes wrong. So let me just go off on this tangent for a second. What can happen is, is that we can see people that we think are godly that get up early. And then we start to say, I'm not godly if I don't get up early. And that would be wrong. I'm talking about my particular conviction about what it looks like for me to be just a seeker. And part of that is, is that um, I want to seek redemptive value in the things that I do. So guess what? I got up early because I have a certain morning routine that includes prayer and meditation. And um, a half hour into it, I had to get some things out of the room. Well, Laura's up and she says, would you mind laying back down with me? I just want you just to, to lay down and just hang out with me. So for a half an hour, I had to like break not only break my morning routine, which I consider redemptive, but also it set me back if I thought of it that way. But then I'm like, no, there's a certain redemptive value to to accommodating my wife who has her own affliction right now and uh, really wanted to just, you know, if, if the day gets away from this, at least we had this half an hour where we were like just hung out together. And that in itself, is I'm trying to say that in itself is seeking the Lord. And I had to change my mindset and say, oh man, I'm not going to get in my meditation and my time in the word the way I wanted to and my, and my fitness. But I did. It was just on a different level. And that level I'm telling you is critical and it's essential to my marriage and to the health of my entire family. And I'm saying in that, I'm telling you, these are the ways that I'm seeking the Lord. How? By changing my mindset in order to see that as part of seeking the Lord is making sure that my wife feels nurtured or cared for. And I'm not always effective at that, by the way, in case I'm trying to create some kind of, um, you know, like Facebook false reality that I, uh, you know, I'm always faithful to getting back into bed and doing the dishes and, you know, taking the kid. Like I, I fail. But I'm also saying at the very same time that this is what it looks like to seek the Lord. And I want to continue in that. And we can pray for each other about that. Also, let me get back to this verse 155. If salvation is, is far from the wicked because they seek not the word, then that means salvation. Conversely, this is what a teacher does. This, and this is, this is considered logic. Conversely, what is true? That means that, that salvation would be close to the wicked if they decided to seek your word, mm -hmm. right? So you can always take like, if, if three Will plus- Will still be considered the wicked though, if they're seeking the word? Because we're sinners, yeah. Okay. You know, remember it says in Psalm 25, therefore he will teach sinners in the way. Okay. So there's a sense in which, yes, you are still inherently sinful, but because you're turning towards him, okay. all, all those things are beginning to change. Yeah. Um, if, if three plus two equals five, then, then a teacher can take the word of God and say, well, then five minus three is going to equal two. So if, if sinners are far from God because they're not seeking him, well, then if a sinner does turn to seek him, the truth is, is that they will not be far from God. Just an interesting thought for everyone to consider. For those of us who have prodigal children or dysfunctional parents that we can't lean on, just remember, they're not, they're only as far from God as just a 180 turn towards seeking him. And God can do anything to make that happen. That's a whole other Sunday morning message. Psalm 119 verse 156 says, Jess, can you read it for us? Yeah, it says, Great are thy tender mercies, O Lord, quicken me according to thy judgments. Okay, so he uses this expression, and it's interesting because Jesse and I, we have these really good talks. Um, this expression he uses, tender mercies, is very unique. He could have said, Great are thy mercies, and that wouldn't have been wrong. But he refers to the Lord's mercies as tender mercies. And not only does he refer to them as tender mercies, but he also says that they're great. And this word great, I believe, means great in, in quantity. Like there are so many tender mercies of God, right? Um, we see God's tender mercy in the way that he 
has saved us. We see God's tender mercy in the way that he is even today delivering us from false realities and negative mindsets and depression, anxiety, even some physical afflictions. We see God's tender mercy in the way that he promises us glory and honor and how he promises us rewards for diligently seeking him. We see his tender mercies and how great they are in the way that he has given us his Holy Spirit and housed his Holy Spirit within us to give us wisdom and enlightenment and understanding and revelation of his word. And we could just do this all day, depending on how much we know the word, we could just continue to talk about the greatness of his tender mercies. That's what David does when he reads the Psalms. And that's what it looks like, I would say, Jess, to be praying without ceasing. Is like right now, we're taking a specific time to be intentional of getting in the word. But you and I both know that a day is going to start when we fold up this laptop and put all this away. And we have to continually be seeking after the greatness of his tender mercies. That's the mindset of the believer. And that's where David is right here. Great are thy tender mercies, O Lord. And then he says, please don't miss this word because it's just a really important word to keep on coming back to. It's this word quicken. He says, quicken me according to thy judgments, right? He said that earlier, I believe as well. Um, verse 154, quicken me, look at this. Quicken me, guys, look, according to thy word. Here he says, quicken me according to thy judgments, which is just another word for the word, word. But but what's really interesting, Jess, watch this. What's interesting is right. what's right before it. 154 says, plead my cause and deliver me, and I want you to quicken me, right? And then he says, greater your tender mercies, Lord, quicken me. What's the difference between plead my cause and deliver me and revive me, and greater your tender mercies, Lord, and revive me? Well, it's a tough question. Yeah, the one, well, he's appealing to uh, different things right. for the, the same thing. Right. He's, he's appealing to God to help him. I guess the word help, uh, deliver is the word save or help or rescue. Right. And revive is pretty much a similar concept. Um, you know, help me, Lord, strengthen me. So in one case, he's saying, look at what I'm going through, so help me. Then he's saying, please my cause, plead my cause, like, God, look at my situation. And then he's now appealing finally 156 to God's love right so first he's appealing to his circumstance yeah look what I'm going through God and right I'm like look look how hard this is help me right and he's saying um, God you love me so help me so yeah okay he's so appealing to God based on who God is is everybody getting what Jesse's saying there because that um, you know the chicken drops down here's the thousand bucks that's the that's the mic drop answer right. is that if you look at what's going on Jesse's saying the first time he, he he says he wants God to revive him and he wants the word of God to bring revival. And he's saying it on the basis of needing to hear his cause like he's in a court of law and he needs deliverance. He needs he needs rescuing. The second time he talks about God reviving him according to his word. It's not because of his listen. It's not because of his affliction. It's because of his affection. I wish I had time room to write that um i'm gonna maybe if i come down with affliction and i just come down here and i'm gonna write i don't know just if you were to write the the word of god is there for us um in the midst of affliction and it is our source of affection like the reason that I love God is because I know God. And the reason that I know God is because of his word, right? So I'm writing here affliction. And then I'm going to write affection. Equals, and then I'm just going to write the word. Now for me, I know what I mean by that because I'm connecting these two ideas here. Um, where creator of thy tender mercies. Uh, Lord, quicken me according to thy judgments. Um, let me look again. I just want to read this. Great are thy tender mercies, Lord. Quicken me according to thy judgments. All right. We're going to have to move on, or I would just stay there for so much longer and talk about the affliction and the affection and just how cool that is. He'll visit it again right down here. Watch this. Let's just jump, guys. You ready? Jump. He says in 159, Oh, how I love thy, thy word. Okay, so, you know, we can see his affection there as well. 
Look at what the Word of God is doing for him in these pieces right here. Okay, thanks. Let's get back. 156, Greater thy tender mercies according to thy judgments. Many are my persecutors and mine enemies. Do not decline from thy testimonies. Okay, wow. So the reason that that kind of is... Uh, flooring to me is and, and we've been here before and jesse and i think we talked about this many are my persecutors jess and my what in 157 my persecutors and my enemies right so do you guys get it like we're talking about david the psalmist and he's writing these really high lofty like words about god's truth but what's he still have in his life persecution and Enemy. Right. So there's this, I don't know where it comes from. I remember uh, being with one of my mentors, Dr. Black, and I was in his office and this person came in and they were talking about all the problems in their life. And they're like, you know, my wife does this and my kids don't even do that. And my boss at work says this. And Jeff just like was sitting in his chair, just like absorbing it all. And I'm like, I have a literally have a legal pad and I'm sitting in the corner because I was an intern um, and I was uh, I had permission to sit in on this session. The guy allowed me to sit in. And then when the guy left, Jeff, like you have to know, you have to know Dr. Black. He like took his hand, one single hand, and he pushed it through his hair like to like kind of reset. And then he took a deep breath and he's like. Where do people get this notion that they should have a problem-free life? And then, and then he just pushed the thing on the back of his on on the back of his you know office chair that like like inclined him a little bit so he could like so that he could like relax. And I just remember I had the legal pad and I'm like I'm ready to write down all the nuances of what the session was about, and that's all he said. So that's all I wrote. And man, I'm telling you, that was 30 years ago. And like, that was one of the biggest truth drops that I could have ever heard is this. I'm going to write it for you guys. Following God does not equal a problem free life. Following God does not equal a problem-free life. I should probably call Jeff and tell him how much that meant to me that one day when he said that. Because um, he probably doesn't even know, right? He was just like, you know. What's that? First Peter 4. What's it say? Hit us. Let me put it in the chat first. Okay. Um, basically, it, it just talks about, like, basically expect to suffer and arm yourself with the same mind. Mm. Mm. There's a couple verses so while you're typing them in, I'm just going to highlight this just where it says, listen to this, yet I do not decline. If you guys were with us yesterday when we were talking about shields up and like about being a warrior in the midst of the battle, it's like, yet I do not decline. Like, don't fall back. Don't quit. Yes, you're going to have persecutors. Yes, you're going to have enemies, but do not decline. Old King James English, don't fade back. Don't fall back. Don't fall away. Don't quit. I'm not going to decline from thy testimonies. So I'm going to say it to you this way, and hopefully it's going to make sense. I'm going to draw a line from the word decline down here. And I'm going to say this. Consistency. And anyone who knows me knows the validity of this statement. Consistency equals victory over my enemy. It might be someone who's your critic. It could be someone who stabbed you in the back. It could be the person who's betrayed you. It could be your abuser. It could be Satan himself. And your consistency is going to give you victory over the enemy. You're going to say, many are my persecutors. Many are mine enemies. Yet, yet I do not decline. And just go through your day right now if you get into a fight. 10 minutes after we leave this this meditation 
and somebody just gets in your face on the phone or literally with their finger it, pointing at and you're just going to say I will not decline from God's word I'm going to I'm going to practice what, what we talked about on Sunday which is a retes and self-restraint and self-control because the fruit of the spirit being born out in my life is that I'm going to have self-control and I'm going to have self-restraint and I'm going to be remember it said virtue I'm going to be of an excellent spirit I'm going to reflect the character of Christ who absorbed it all from all the persecutors and from all the enemies he absorbed it all on the cross and anytime I'm able to absorb and keep consistency and have the victory I become a shadow of my Savior's victory on the cross. Does that make sense? We'll move on to 158. Jess, can you read? Oh, do you want to tell us what you had from Peter there? Yeah, yeah. So 1 Peter 4 says, For as much then as Christ hath suffered in this, suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he had, that hath suffered in the flesh hath ce ceased. This King James is getting my tongue. Ceased? Ceased from sin. All right. Um, and all that. Um, but yeah, it says Christ suffered in the flesh, so arm yourself, basically prepare yourself with the same mindset. Then First Peter 4.12 says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened to you. Wow. But rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's suffering. <laughs> and, uh... But basically, like, that reminded me of your counseling session or the one you sat in on. Like, people think it's strange right. when they go through a trial. They're like, oh, what's going what on? What the? Yeah, yeah exactly. Strange. Like, God says, like, don't think it's strange. Like, don't think it's um, something, like, unplanned or weird yeah. or abnormal. It's, it's yeah. actually normal. That's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we'll look at 158, and then we'll we'll come to a close here. Three verses quickly. I beheld the transgressors. Okay, so right away, just because it's a morning meditation, this is like I, I want to also not just talk about what we're pulling out as far as meaning, but how we study the Bible. So right now, I just read that verse, and I'm like, oh, look at that. There's persecutors, there's enemies, and now there's transgressors. Do you see that? Um, you see the the mindset of the the psalmist as he's writing. And let's see what he says about them. He says he beheld them. Okay, hey guys, do you ever behold your transgressors? What do you think of your enemies? That was what I titled this little morning meditation. You know, what do you think of your enemies? Here, here's what he says. I beheld the transgressors. Okay, in other words, he he didn't just see them with his eyeballs. He's he's beholding them. They're in front of him and he's considering them. And, and, and what happens is, is he's grieved. Okay, he's grieved. But why is he grieved? Jess, what's the rest of 158 say? And he's grieved because they kept not the word. Right. It, 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 look, Jesse, you know, he is a good pastor. And I really think that he'll, he's a good, he's going to make for a good shepherd of men. But he is an evangelist at heart. And it doesn't say that he was grieved with transgressors because they knew not the word mm. because if someone doesn't know the word we shouldn't be we shouldn't be another another translation says they i was disgusted with the jesse uses the uh, esv i was disgusted with the transgressors because they kept not thy word we, we shouldn't be disgusted with people that don't know the word because they're ignorant but when someone doesn't keep the word and you know what the word keep means? It means to possess it, to hold on to it, to, 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 to hide in it. You know, like a keeper, like a zookeeper, a lion keeper. Like we talked about the keeper of the gate or the keeper or the keep in the, in the location in the castle. When someone doesn't keep the word, now that ought to disgust us. You know why? Because that's what disgusted Jesus. So if we're reflecting the heart of Christ, and you remember when he saw the man with the withered hand, and he said... Um, he said, stretch forth thy hand. And it said the people, the, 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 it says that the, the religious leaders, they murmured against him because he was healing on the Sabbath. And it says, Jesus looked round about them with anger. And then he spoke. And it was interesting. You know, of course, he talked about if it was wrong to heal on the Sabbath. But the point is, does that sound familiar to you? Yeah. 
He looked round about them with anger. It's very interesting if you do a little study about how many times Jesus got angry. What really, what really angered Jesus, a la the money changers, two times in the Gospels, um, um, you know, when he was with his disciples and they didn't let the children come to him. It, what really is it, what really brings a passionate response to the heart of Christ is when there are people that are considered to be disciples, teachers of the word, and they're not keeping that very word that they profess or that they present. He's saying, I'm, my, I'm, I'm grieved because of the transgressors. They're not keeping your word. So let our hearts break for those who don't know the word. But let us be disgusted, especially with ourselves in regards to those who don't keep the word. And I hope that that I hope that that disgust is a sacred disgust, a righteous disgust, one that would lead us to um, a godly response, not to an ungodly response. So David then says in Psalm 159, consider how I love thy precepts, that thy word quicken me. Here he uses it again. Where's the orange? Revive me, O Lord, according to thy loving kindness. Quicken. And then quicken. You see this? This is a very, this is a, a major word being used here in this particular. It's in 154, and then it's in 156. Now it's in 159. Quicken me, O Lord, according to thy loving kindness. There's that word again, Jess. Yeah. Um, very similar to tender mercies. He could have just said love, or he could have said kindness, but instead he says loving kindness. Were you going to say something, Jess? It's sad. What's that? Hesed. Hesed. Yeah, right. Hesed. According to thy loving kindness, right? It's a it's a very a tender word that he uses here about the Lord, the the covenantal name Yahweh for God. According to thy loving kindness, he loves he loves again. There's affliction, but you're also seeing affection here. So, for the sake of time, let's move to this final verse, and it says, "Jess, can you read one sixty for us?" Yeah, one sixty says. Thy word is true. Um, you're going to need to put the Bible down so you can see a little bit. Oh, thanks. Oh, good. Uh, it says, thy still a little bit. There you go. Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Good. All right, so... Now, he says precepts, statutes, you know, um, so now he actually uses the word, word here, and he says that they are true. This is a powerful expression. They are true from the beginning. And Jess, how do you define truth? That which is consistent with that which is reality. Right, right. That which is consistent with that which is reality. And what is reality? Then, you know, if I was a philosopher, I would say, well, then what is reality? And then I would say reality is when you run into a brick wall and find out what it isn't. Right. So in other words, like when you go through life, you come up against certain things and you realize that they are not consistent and that that is not reality. Like that helps you know what reality is. Does that does that help anybody a little bit? Thy word is true from the beginning. In other words, it, it, it's true from Genesis to Revelation. God's word is true from creation all the way to our destination in heaven. God's word is true entirely, and God's word is true throughout eternity. Like true. In a world today where it's hard to know what's true because there is virtual this and pseudo that and faux flowers that look so real and faux blinds like my blinds in my on my windows in my room they're called faux blinds because they have grain in them that makes them look like real wood and the truth is these things are just plastic it's hard i remember going to subway and i saw this hoagie man that just looks so good and the whole thing was made of rubber like we hardly know what's true anymore you know what's true god's word is true 
And not only that, it's true from the beginning. So isn't it interesting that there were things that might have been true, but they're not true now? I mean, if you look at a, a science textbook from the 50s and you look at one today, what was true then isn't true now. Um, this is the word of God and it's true from the beginning. Right? Or there are new truths that we've discovered that we never knew before, but this is saying, no, what was true is true and will always be true, right? And so I'm going to write that here. I'm going to write E-N-T-I-R-E-L-Y entirely and eternally, E-T-E-R-N-A-L-L-Y, entirely and eternally, exclamation mark, right? And it's true from Jen to rev right and from creation to heaven thy word is true from the beginning every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever so that's why i'm going to put circle the word ever and then i want to connect those two concepts with each other and man i think we're going to have to leave it there for today so I hope that was helpful to you. Man, there's so much to look at. And um, Jess, would you pray us in and maybe look at these things in particular in this passage and we can yeah, use that as... Oh, yeah, just please do. on the word of truth and just put some comments of scriptures that testify to this reality. John 17, 17, Jesus says, Thy word is truth. Proverbs 30, verse 5, mm. Every word of God proves true. John 10, 35, the scripture cannot be broken. Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Mm, mm, mm. So look in the comments to see other scriptures that talk about how God's word is true. Love it. Love so it. So let's pray. Father, uh, we do thank you for your truth, Lord. We thank you that we have a anchor for the soul, a hope, Lord, a truth. Um, that one of your names, Lord, is faithful and true. Mm. Lord, with the world of deception and lies and the enemy who's the father of lies, Lord. Uh, we thank you that we have the father of truth. Uh, uh, he's yes, greater, Lord. greater than he who's in the world. Thank and you, see that's in us, Lord. So help us to uh, continue in your truth and in your love all the days of our life. In mm -hmm. Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Jesse. And look, if um, I'm going to ask one of you that's still online with us. What's one of you um, put into the, the comment section? Would you put a link to uh, the Sunday morning message from yesterday? It's probably, um, it's up on YouTube right now. It should be if you go to Coastal Christian with Pastor Matt Stokes. If you could just put that in the link. There are so many people that just seem really blessed by the message yesterday, um, which to me, right, is really blessed because um, I kind of thought I was flying around the clouds off on some tangential thoughts. And then I find out, of course, that the Holy Spirit was saying this is exactly what people are needing and um, ironically and and humbly it's the parts that I actually didn't plan for 20 hours writing that week that actually were the most helpful to people were the parts that God just decided to kind of download right in the moment and um, I think sometimes that's just the Lord trying to say hey man this is always about me so just always remember um, you know no matter how much you press your your jacket and you and you polish your shoes in the end I'm the one who blesses everybody you're the vehicle so thanks for being the pitcher but I am the living water and um, I'm so blessed that people are are inspired convicted and whatever else the Holy Spirit needed to give to people seems to have been given yesterday so if you didn't catch the message or you want to share it with someone else I would encourage you to do that. Um, it seemed like it was particularly helpful to a lot of people yesterday. And if it's helpful to you, please share by bringing someone. Bring them into that redemptive space. 22 West Dawes Avenue is where we meet. It's Dawes Avenue School. That's where Coastal Christian meets. We'll be there again, if the Lord wills, this Sunday morning. And as far as these morning meditations, it's our pleasure always to be with you. And we'll be here again tomorrow. And hopefully we will look forward to seeing you there. That's right. God bless you guys.